I'm David Laidman, the editor of Science and Society. This is co-sponsored by the Brecht Forum, of course, which sponsors all its events, and uh, the journal Science and Society. Our offices are right around the corner there. This is what we look like. We are um, in our starting our 73rd year of publication, and we believe that Science and Society is the longest continuously published journal of Marxist scholarship in the world in any language. Now, we've yet to, um, I need to say Science and Society isn't for everyone. Uh, Marx studies the new European Renaissance, you know, value the German debate, temporality and calculus. Ooh. Oh, here's something better, British communism and post-war race relations. You, you get a mix of articles. You get historical articles, literary articles, kind of theoretical economic articles. Uh, but some of them are uh, required, they, they, they require a little bit of work going in, but you get a payback coming out. And it has an enormously long shelf life. If we look back at the back issues of the journal, there's <laughs> remarkable things. Uh, so I urge you to become acquainted with us and to uh, subscribe uh, if you feel so inclined. We also have a website, scienceandsociety.com, listed in here and on, the, uh, on the, this free, free thing that I'm handing out so that you can always uh, get in touch with us. Okay, uh, our speaker tonight is someone that I met when he submitted in an article to Science and Society, <laughs> of all things. Uh, it was a number of years ago. We, he, Jerry is from Chicago, Jerry Harris, of course. Jerry is from, uh, from Chicago and uh, I'm not. I'm from New York, so we didn't really, I didn't get to Chicago that much. Uh, but uh, he sent an article on a topic he was interested in at that time, which was the historiography of U.S. communism. It was remarkable, a remarkable piece of, uh, of scholarly digging into the way uh, the, uh, uh, the Khrushchev speech, the so-called secret speech in 1956 was received in the United States. It still repays, it's still one of the richest articles on that whole episode that, uh, that I know of. And I was so impressed by the uh, the partisan, if you can call it this, the partisan disinterestedness. You know, there, there was partisanship, and yet he really, he really was digging for the truth without, uh, you know, without preconceptions. It was wonderful. Um, and subsequently, Jerry, who teaches at the DeVry Institute in Chicago, history, history department, uh, has become, with William Robinson, uh, who's very well known from, uh, from the West Coast, uh, a spokesperson for the point of view that uh, it, looking at globalization and the nature of capitalist globalization that uh, we are moving away from a world of nation states into a world of growing, developing transnational capitalist formations, both class and state formations. He'll explain in more detail in a few minutes <laughs> when he speaks to you. Uh, and he's written for us together with Bill Robinson and by himself on this topic. He is also the, uh, the secretary, I wanted to call you the secretary general, but that's not right. General secretary. The general secretary is better. <laughs> of the Global Studies Association, which he has introduced me to and in getting me to participate in, uh, which is a wonderful organization that brings people together from all over the world, actually, to do global studies. And uh, it's right up the line of the sort of things that all of us are concerned with. Uh, I can't commit him to anything, but I'll bet he'll have a word to say or two to say about the current economic crisis. So uh, whatever uh, he talks about is going to be of great interest. Uh, what we'll do is we'll have a presentation, then take a break of about 10 minutes and circulate and come back and have a long question period where, and discussion period. And with a, an audience of this size, which to me is optimal, it's not too small and not too large, we can get into a really good discussion. So uh, without further delay, let me give you Jerry Harris. Thank you. Well, thanks for uh, coming out tonight. really appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to try to speak maybe about 40 minutes or so. And uh, then they say we could take a break and come back and get into a discussion. Uh, and uh, I want to lay out the uh, theses around the transnational capitalist class and our idea of what globalization and how to char characterize it. But I also want to maybe spend the last five or 10 minutes on Obama and uh, perhaps uh, how uh, Obama's election will influence globalization a bit too, so we'll, we'll, that's where I'll uh, end up on. Now, uh, in looking at globalization, I think that uh, my approach to it, and also uh, Bill Robinson's and some other people like Leslie Sklar, 
is uh, different from um, many of the mainstream progressive and left views of globalization, which sees globalization mainly as a U.S. project, uh, and that this project has been fo fostered on the rest of the world. Uh, and in particular, it's a new mode of domination of U.S. hegemony over the third world and sort of have forced Europe into neoliberalism and to give up social democracy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I actually think that globalization is a much broader and deeper uh, process than uh, simply a U.S. project. Uh, and in fact, it's the universalization of capitalism uh, uh, being led by the transnational capitalist class, which is present in every country in, throughout the world today, usually uh, in a leadership uh, position uh, within the political economy of each nation. So I want to uh, go into that characterization and analysis uh, for a bit, uh, and then, like I say, uh, uh, sort of uh, wrap it up with uh, maybe a current look at the uh, presidential election. So I think um, this uh, era that we're in, first of all, it's a transitional era, uh, and there's a lot of flexibility to it. Uh, and what we're essentially seeing is the uh, uh, sort of a new economy putting together, being put together on a global scale. So we have a descending mode of accumulation, which is the old nation-centric national market mode of accumulation, being challenged and replaced by an ascending mode of accumulation, which is globalization. Uh, and in fact, the contradictions and the tensions between these two modes of capitalist accumulation really lays the groundwork for most of the political and social uh, struggles and uh, problems that we're seeing throughout the world today. That is the central dialectic in the world, this transformation. So let me make one clarification on uh, this position that we're always sort of running into this for some reason. Uh, we uh, do believe the nation state is still important and that uh, national markets still exist. The, the thing is though, is that the, the state is being repositioned uh, by the transnational class to function for and serve patterns of global accumulation. And so that the transnational capitalist class is working to insert uh, every national economy into these new patterns, global patterns, not national patterns. And so the nation state is being redefined for the current mode of accumulation. And in fact, that's a huge struggle between national forms of capitalists and transnational forms of capitalists. And, and we can see that split and division um, clearly, I, I would say, in every country. And in some ways, I would argue that the uh, Bush administration represented a more nationalist uh, block of uh, capitalists uh, based on the military industrial complex uh, rather than the uh, transnational capitalists, which Clinton and in fact, Bush Sr. Uh, represented. And I think Obama, but we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. So, uh, so just for that clarification, because like I say, we're often attacked as saying the nation state no longer matters. So I, people must get that from some of the journalists or something in you know, the Wall Street Journal, but it certainly doesn't come from a Marxist study of the world. So let me uh, lay out uh, a little bit these two forms, these two modes of accumulation. How, how do we characterize uh, the descending nation-centric form and how do we characterize the, the global form. The um, uh, one thing to look at, and let me, let me deal with the nation-centric one first, assets, employment, and sales. Uh, and uh, when you're looking at the old sort of industrial nation, national market, the majority of assets, the majority of employment, and the majority of sales were based in the national market itself. Uh, probably some of us are old enough here to remember that what's good for GM is good for America. Yeah. We grew up with that one. You know, then that was true. I mean, they, their assets, their employment, their sales, majority was right here in the United States. Now, we had a large international economy, but that international economy was mainly based on the exports of goods from the national base. And so you would have this international competition through the exports into each other economies, right? That's different from the global assembly line that we're looking at today, and I'll get into that in a, in a little bit. Uh, we had the old social contracts. So we had the uh, 
New Deal social contract in America. We had the social democratic New Deal in Europe. We had uh, the Iron Rice Bowl in China. We had social responsibility uh, in Japan. So those types of broad social contracts existed in the industrial national market era that brought in large sections of the middle class and working class. Not everybody, but the majority of the population were included in these social contracts. Um, you had protectionism and subsidies uh, as an important part of uh, these national economies. And that's one way to judge uh, policies today, is looking at where they're going on protectionism and, and subsidies. Um, we also had um, uh, a value-added manufacturing in the North and outside imperialist domination of the South and um, concentrated land ownership, particularly in the third world, that was rooted back into the old agrarian societies. Now, I would argue globalization has none of those characteristics. And in fact, while there are still economic and political and social actors who are wedded uh, to the old nation-centric form and fight to protect it and to expand it and to keep it, they are being challenged every day uh, by the globalists, uh, and they're being challenged on every front, and in fact, they've been losing most of the battles for the past 20 or 25 years. But those battles are ongoing and create a lot of the political ferment that we see. So let's look at the global uh, characters, of the globalist mode of accumulation. Well, let's look at assets, employment, and sales once again. And here, actually, the United Nations uh, does some great work. They're, uh, uh, every year, uh, and they put out statistics on the 100 largest transnational corporations, and they actually have something called the transnationality index ratio. And they look at the ratio of nationally held assets to foreign-owned assets, to national employment and foreign employment, and national sales to foreign sales. And, and for all the largest corporations in the world, the average is 57% of their assets, employment, and sales are outside of their national market. For some, much higher. For some, like well, obviously, like Nokia, it's 95%, 98% outside their national market because how can you be a global leader based on the market in Finland, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's clear. But for GM, for General Electric, for Toyota, for all the major corporations in the world, they're more invested outside of their home market than inside of their home market. And so uh, when you look at the managers and the CEOs and the major investors and the board of trustees, what space do they live in in terms of their daily existence, their, their mental space, their concerns? They're looking at the entire, entire world in terms of accumulation. They're looking at uh, Tax, uh, tax laws and legislation and where they can get their energy and where is the cheapest um, uh, labor and where are the developing markets. And they're not just looking at the American market. Or they're not just looking at the German market. They're looking at markets throughout the world, uh, in fact, where they have their investments. And that's the space that they occupy every day. They have a globalist space uh, in their thinking and in their strategy. And we see that uh, in, for example, the average uh, uh, foreign affiliate ownership of these 100 largest corporations is 22,869 own foreign affiliates. That's the average amount of foreign affiliates each of these 100 largest transnational corporations have. And the importance of foreign affiliates is that they've overtaken the importance of exports by over 200%. So in other words, that uh, when we talk, a lot of people who talk about nation-centric sort of competition um, characterize it as an export competition. You know, American exports and German exports and Chinese exports coming into America. Uh, the, the export economy is much smaller than the production being carried out by foreign affiliates. Foreign affiliates inside country after country after country, that production is 200 times greater than the entire world trade in exports, right? So it's part of this global accumulation pattern that you sell everywhere, you employ everywhere, you own everywhere, you invest everywhere, and not just in the home base. Um, so cross-border uh, cross mergers and acquisitions 
are one important thing to look at. Joint ventures, uh, foreign direct investment, uh, open capital flows and the financialization of capital. All these things are uh, important indicators of the global economy. And I'm not going to throw out a bunch of data on that stuff, but you can certainly read the pages of Science and Society and, and get those figures. Um, another important aspect is cross-border stock ownership. So when people talk about an American corporation or a German corporation, I mean, what are we really talking about at this point? Because when you look at the ownership of these corporations, the, uh, and you see in the stocks, that you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 percent of the stocks are going to be owned by capitalists throughout the world. It's just not American capitalists who own GE or German capitalists who own Siemens. You look at the, if you look at the DAX in Germany or the CAC in France or FTSE in London or the South Korean stock markets, we see consistently 42, 45, 48 percent of the stock owned by people outside of those countries. And if you want to look at uh, how the Chinese and the Russians are integrated into the global accumulation patterns, look at where they're putting their companies up uh, for stock investments. They list them in London, they list them in Hong Kong, and they raise billions and billions of dollars from foreign interests, right, uh, transnational capitalists investing in those, in those companies through the listing on foreign, foreign stocks. So uh, when we think about ownership and uh, uh, we have to think about the transnational capitalist class and how it crosses borders. Now let me just turn over my page of notes here. Um, on the production side, uh, of course, we think about the global assembly line, right? Uh, and um, so different parts being made uh, in different countries and assembled somewhere else. And cars are a good example of that, where you may be getting tires from Michelin in France and uh, a gearbox from South Korea and uh, uh, another uh, uh, element from Japan, and maybe it's being assembled in Tennessee or Detroit, but is that a, an American car? Uh, not really. I mean, a GM, uh, what largest market in the world for GM is China. Uh, and uh, GM has more employees and more assets outside the United States than inside the United States. Uh, so are we really saving an American corporation? Or are we saving a transnational corporation through through the bailouts, right? Uh, and what interests are really being represented here, national interests or transnational interests? Um, the spread and access of technology and knowledge worldwide is part of globalization, certainly. I remember uh, being on a panel uh, with a good friend in Chicago and a number of years back at DePaul, and he was saying America's going to maintain their technological lead uh, far, far into the future. Well, no way. I mean. You know, people are, people everywhere have the same brain, uh, and this stuff is flowing back and forth. There's no way to, to monopolize it anymore, even with intellectual property rights. Chinese are good at stealing uh, intellectual, and, and, and more power to them, right, uh, for it, I, I would say. Um, another important aspect of this, I think, is the emergence of economic centers of power in the South. And I want to speak a little more about this in a few minutes. but. Uh, that is certainly does not fit into the old nation-centric analysis of imperialism, which sees that relationship as a one-way street of ex exploitation and oppression. Um, on this thing of uh, competition, um, it's, I just don't see it as an America versus German economy versus a Russian economy versus a Chinese economy. Uh, Transnational corporations certainly compete against each other uh, to be a monopoly, to be the biggest in the world, or at least to be one of the top three in the world. But that is not national competition. That's transnational competition that spreads all over the world and is fought on every front. Uh, now, transnational corporations will certainly use uh, their roots in, a, in the countries of national origin as a competitive advantage. And they're certainly not above approaching their own governments to uh, protect them or to give them some uh, subsidy or, or some competitive advantage in, in, in what used to be the home market. But that is just one tool out of hundreds of tools they use in competition. So, uh, so we shouldn't, I think, be uh, 
overemphasize uh, when a GM comes to the American government and says, give me a, you know, $20 billion. Uh, they're active everywhere, and they lobby everywhere politically. You know, a good example here is Siemens, uh, which is GE's great competitor out of Germany. Because Siemens is uh, in every state of the union. It's one of uh, the 100 largest employers in America. So is Siemens as a major German transnational corporation. Is, is it Germany out competing America here? Well, Siemens is part of the American economy. You know, and GE is part of the German economy, uh, right? And, and, and Siemens doesn't want to somehow out compete the American economy. They're dependent on the American economy. They want to see people employed here. They want to see a healthy market here. They want to have people buying their products here. They employ tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Americans here. So, and look at Toyota, look at Honda. Uh, and so they're all this integrated, interconnected, transnational markets are everywhere. So it's not Germany's going to beat us or we're going to beat the Russians or the Chinese are going to beat us. It's a totally integrated in terms of production, in terms of finance, more and more on the uh, board of trustees and stock ownership. At every level, the organic construction of the transnational class is proceeding, uh, even in, in the face of the economic crisis that we're facing today. Um, I want to talk a bit about the information revolution uh, in terms of explaining the depth of uh, globalization and how I think it's important to consider this in, in also in terms of it not simply being a U.S. project. Um, I think the revolution in information technologies, digitalization, microprocessors, communication technologies uh, has had a huge impact on globalization. In fact, I would say it's the skeleton o o through which globalization functions. And that globalization really would have been impossible without the IT revolution. It just opened up totally new vistas uh, for capitalism to grow in new ways. Uh, and that uh, the key thing to understand about IT and digitalization microprocessors is that they revolutionize the tools of production. It's th and they're different from other technologies because of that. Now some people will say the auto was a tremendously important technology after 1945, and it was, and it had a huge cultural and social and economic impact on America. But automobiles did not revolutionize other means of production. Microprocessors are in absolutely everything that we touch and use. I mean, hell, there's, there's more computing power in your car than the first module that landed on the moon. And in fact, it's been like that for 15 years already. Uh, so whether it's your watch, or if you go into a factory and you look at the lathe machine and you look at the computer banks that run the assembly lines. In fact, um, IT hit the blue collar industries before they became a white collar uh, uh, technology. Uh, and um, so you have to think way beyond just computers and fax machines and satellites and that. I'll give you an example from my own experience, in fact, on, um, in terms of manufacturing and IT and manufacturing. When I worked at US Steel, uh, in Chicago, uh, and uh, I was in the blast furnace for a couple of years, got laid off there, and bid in into a job in the machine shop. And I uh, went into an apprenticeship program. It takes about five years to become a journeyman machinist. And you're learning all sorts of pretty complex machines and how to run them. You're learning three-dimensional blueprint reading. You're learning metallurgy. You're learning trigonometry. You're getting tested on all that stuff every six months. I remember if we got less than 74% on our test, we could be laid off, which was a little more pressure than going to college in some ways. Uh, uh, and we get tested on the machines in the shop. You know, some you'll be working on a lathe machine for nine months. The foreman will come up, give you a blueprint, say, make this in two hours to specifications. That's your test. Um, along comes numerical control technology in, into the machine. And we're talking about a big machine shop, you know, about two, two football fields long. Uh, and um, so one day we're coming in to work our lathe machines, and we have uh, computer boards attached to our machines. And uh, instead of getting blueprints, the foremen are walking up to us, and, and they're giving us a sheet of paper with ones and zeros and, and uh, A, B, C, and we, get, we got a board, a keyboard. And we punch it, and we, you know, we, we, we punch in the numbers, and the machine starts to work itself and does all the cuts, right? Uh, all the trigonometry, all the angles, all the speeds, 
all that was programmable. And so they put the chip in the machine and the information technology was taking away our jobs very rapidly. So uh, we were reduced to just putting, up, you know, putting the metal on the machine and then taking it off and then punching in a new code and watching the machine. And so, of course, what occurs to the managers and the foremen at U.S. Steel? Now, we got a line of about 40 or 50 very skilled lathe machinists who've taken years to study and learn all the stuff. We're standing around watching our machines, you know, and then, and that, so they're walking up and down this line thinking, why do we need 50, 50 machinists here? We could have one guy look after five machines, so let's, let's get rid of 40 guys and keep 10, right? Exactly what happened. They started laying, laying people off left and right. And in fact, on one day, the day that I got laid off, they laid off every apprentice throughout the entire mill. There were 6,000 workers. We had 800 apprentices in 10 or 12 different um, programs, whether they were electricians or machinists or tool and die operators. The technology was just becoming overwhelming. And they said, we don't need any apprentice anymore because we don't need this many skilled workers anymore. The information technology is replacing them. Let's lay them all off. And that's what they did to us. And one day, 800 apprentices, all of them got kicked out of the mill. And of course, eventually the mill shut down anyways. But uh, so that gives you an idea of the power of the information technology, how the information technology changes the tools of production, which therefore changes the relations of production. Because the relationship that we as steel workers had with the steel bosses all of a sudden changed radically. They didn't need our labor anymore. We, we were out of the mill, which therefore changed the entire steel community in South Chicago that had existed there for 120 years, where the Union Hall was the center of activity for not only union meetings, but weddings and Christmas parties and graduation parties. All of a sudden, that, that, that headquarters is being shut down because there's no members. There's no more steel uh, baseball teams and basketball teams in the park. Uh, people are you know, uh, being dispersed throughout other jobs and other parts of the city. So you lose a whole way of life and a sort of an industrial mass space. So the, the, the changing technology changed the relations of production in a very important ways and changed political relationships and power relationships and the structure of the union along with it. Um, in um, the other uh, part of this picture is financialization uh, and the effects that computers have had on capital. And <laughs> boy, we're really seeing it right now. But uh, the type of financialization that, that has been going on for about the last 20 or 30 years has, would have been impossible without computers, right? And without the speed of computers. I mean, so many people think maybe of the internet when they think of computers. Well, the internet is extremely important and really we can think of the internet as the first world machine, right? It's one machine that is connected worldwide. And it gives the capitalist class the ability of command and control in real time, right? Computers, and faxes and satellites. It means that you don't have to wait for that phone call or for the message the next day or the mail to come. You can run a company everywhere in the world in real time at the same time. But the financialization and all these different devices that have been created by the stock markets, uh, no one is moving gold around anymore in cars and trucks, right? It's all digitalized and it rockets around the world in virtual space. So, uh, in fact, there's one computer right over here in New Jersey, which the New York Times called the heart of world capitalism, because uh, $2 billion goes through that computer every minute of their, the day, 24-7. $2 billion a minute. And there's another computer over in Belgium that does the same thing. It's the European computer. Not quite $2 billion over there, but $1.7 or $1.8. Uh, and if you think of, uh, well, let me uh, give you one of my favorite uh, examples, which is the money market, right? Money simply looking for other forms of money. No value is created here, but tremendous wealth can be gotten. So wealth as totally alienated from the idea of value, right? Uh, so money, does, money, look, money markets look for arbitrage between the value of money. So you may be sitting at a computer in Citibank here in New York, and you're looking at the value of, let's say, the euro in Frankfurt and in Tokyo at the same time. And maybe there's a one hundredth of a penny difference between the price that your computer program is going to pick up. 
And what your computer program is, it does is starts to buy those yens where they're a little lower, let's say, the, I mean, the euro is, let's say, a little lower in, in Frankfurt, and they say, well, let's pick up 20 billion of that right now. And just as you're buying that 20 million, you're turning it over immediately in Tokyo for that, to make that one hundredth of one penny on each euro. And if you just put 20 billion in, well, you're going to walk off with 20 or 30 million dollars in profit within a few minutes. It turns over that fast. So this market is 1.7 trillion dollars every day. 1.7 trillion a day. And 90% of that money spends less than five days in any one country. So it's continually, continually turning over, right? Now, what is a trillion dollars? Because we start to throw around these figures, millions and billions and trillions, and it's hard to conceptualize. One of the best examples I've ever heard is that one million seconds is 12 and a half days. One trillion seconds is 36,000 years. So <laughs> one million seconds, 12 and a half days. One trillion seconds, 36,000 years. So that's, that's a way to start to judge the stuff when you're starting to read in the paper about 700 billion being given out to Pulse, and that, which gets close to a trillion dollars. So we're talking about real money here. You know, uh, and uh, 1.7 trillion running around, rocketing around on computers looking for other money. And the thing is that most of this money isn't, there's no even human sitting at the computer anymore. It's black box trading. Uh, and black box trading uh, runs on algorithms. So you hire a hotshot programmer uh, and uh, you write the algorithm. And so the computers are out looking at each other, right? The Tokyo and Frankfurt and London and New York uh, computers are all trying to read each other's information that's out there. And when they see the figures that they've been programmed to see or want, the sell, boom, sell, or boom, buy. And they just start, and, and you don't need anybody there. It's just the computers are doing the trading. Uh, so you talk about a strange world. I mean, you know, uh, you know, well, you know, value, the wealth without value, and uh, wealth without almost any human input. I mean, as long as you own the uh, the program and the computers, and you got the cash, you know, you're you're swinging. Uh, and of course, uh, that created this incredible empty economy that just crashed around us, right? Because it's an economy based on no value. It's just an economy based on money chasing money in all sorts of weird ways, like the derivatives. For every, there's $1 trillion in mortgages out there, but there's 62 trillion in insurances on those mortgages. That's, that's where the whole thing collapsed. That people who had no relationship to the original mortgage are betting on whether those mortgages are going to be good or bad, hedge funds. So, and so for every $1 in the mortgage, you had $62 in people betting on where the mortgage was going to go, up or down. And again, these types of uh, speculations in financial markets would in be impossible to construct without information technologies, right? And they're worldwide. And it's not that Americans forced Europeans to do this. Europeans came to the trough fully enthusiastic about neoliberalism. And so did the Japanese, and so did elements in, in other countries. It wasn't forced on them. Uh, they said, this is a wonderful way to, to get rich. Uh, some sectors opposed it, but other sectors said, yeah, I'm part of this class. Let's, let's do this type of mode of accumulation. So um, um, the key thing here that I'm trying to argue is not that capitalist logic has changed. The logic is the same. The law of accumulation, the need to profit, competition, the principles that Marx laid out in his political economy, I believe all that is the same. The key thing is that it unfolds in a different way. The information technology has allowed the logic of capitalism to take new roads and new forms and make money in qualitatively different, different ways. And so we get the economy that we have today. Uh, and that's why, in part, I would argue that globalization on a political economy level 
is much greater than just a U.S. project. This is a global project with a transnational capitalist class based in the new information technology tools. Now, let me just spend a little time on the rise of the South and then get to Obama, and then we could take a break and uh, uh, come back and you could all criticize what I've been saying. Um, the, uh, I think the rise of the South is, uh, and, and we're talking China and Brazil and South Africa and India, and we could even throw Russia in there now, and even Turkey and Mexico, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's obviously there's still sweatshops and uh, a fierce exploitation and environmental problems in all these countries, but there's also a hell of a lot of new wealth. And it is not just new wealth for the elite and for the top of those societies. If you look at the data, that wealth has been creating new middle classes in all those countries, and in fact, it is even coming down to the working class. And so, uh, for example, in China, where obviously there's a lot of uh, sweatshops and exploitation, but why do all those millions of peasants come to the city if it's so horrible? Those jobs are better than what they had out in the rural areas. They pay more. They're crappy conditions, but they pay more, and it allows them and their families to buy TVs and to buy a washing machine and maybe a car uh, and maybe a better house. Uh, and that is happening, and it's happening in a very powerful way. Um, so it's not that we uh, take our eye off the exploitation, but we have to understand the incredible dynamic economic power that's coming out of the South uh, today. And in many ways, that has taken uh, sectors of the globalists in the, in the North or Europe and the U.S. Uh, by surprise. I mean, I think uh, some uh, 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 of the political and economic elite in these countries certainly went into globalization thinking of, not as a U.S. project, but certainly as a Western project. Uh, uh, but uh, 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 look at sovereign wealth funds uh, and the trillions of dollars in sovereign wealth funds. Uh, and if you read the Financial Times, for example, or look at some of the statements of many of the uh, economists who speak for the globalist point of view, like Bernstein, uh, Bergstein from the uh, Peterson Institute, or Stiglitz, or Krugman, or even Summers and Rubin, uh, although there's differences between all these guys, they're all welcoming this development. None of them are, are anti-sovereign wealth funds. There more money circulated. In fact, we need it. Uh, financial Times said sovereign wealth funds and the financial crisis in the West uh, is a perfect match. Come save us. We, please invest in our banks. Please invest in the, our hedge funds. Uh, 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 now, you have some sectors, obviously, in the U.S. and in Europe who are saying, oh, man, these, these third world countries, are, it's, they're going to take over. Our, we want to keep this money out protect ourselves. The Chinese are coming, the Indians, the Brazilians are coming, they're going to take over. Well, that's one of the splits I was talking about between the nationalists and the globalists. But the globalists, if you read their stuff, they aren't scared of the money. They want that money. And it's the, the organic integration of the transnational capitalist class is what we're seeing. That's why they welcome the money. And these investments are strategic investments for China and these other countries. Yeah, the Chinese, what, put 500 billion or something into uh, Blackstone? Uh, so yeah, they've, they've lost money, but it's a strategic investment in one of the most important financial institutions in the US and the world. Uh, and it allows them to gain all sorts of experience. So when they buy into Barclays and they buy into Citibank and they buy into this and they buy into that, whether or not we're having a financial crisis right now and where they may be losing some money, they're already thinking five and 10 and 20 years down the line about building these organic strategic relationships. Yeah. Sovereign wealth funds? Sovereign wealth funds are huge funds owned by governments uh, based uh, largely on uh, the uh, uh, money that they're making off of exports to the West and oil revenues because they're, they're also very big in the Middle East. So if you have a, a state-run oil corporation, like in Saudi Arabia or, or other Middle Eastern countries, a lot of that money goes into sovereign wealth funds. The trillions of dollars that have been coming into China through their exports to the US and to Europe, a lot of that money goes into sovereign wealth funds, and they're under control in terms of their investments and where they're going to put it. The governments control the sovereign wealth funds. 
So they're not private, uh, private, private funds. Uh, and uh, some of the capitalists and some other uh, observers, like, uh, well, Pat Buchanan, who's always worth a quote or two, uh, you know, th they're freaked out from a nationalist point of view. Uh, you know, these are government funds. You know, capitalism is about the private market. Well, we have status globalizers. You know, neoliberalism is not the only form of globalization. It was simply the first form, the revolution. And when you have a revolution, you always have the most radical uh, uh, char character of your ideology and your program. And who were the most radical neoliberals? Thatcher and Reagan. And it beat down the barriers of Keynesianism and it beat down the barriers of socialism. But it, uh, neo that neoliberal form is, uh, and I could actually segue into Obama, I guess, at this point, uh, is, I would argue, being replaced uh, rapidly by a neo-Keynesian globalism and a status globalism, status in the third world in terms of China and India and the Middle East. But when we look at Obama, um, let me just set my time here, okay. Um, I think the Obama election is putting together a new hegemonic block uh, in, in, with, with, within the US and that we need to sort of perhaps use a Gramscian analysis to uh, understand the transformation uh, that, that America is going through at, at this moment. Uh, I would argue that the last hegemonic bloc that's really dominated the US uh, for the past 30 years, whether or not they were in the White House, has, but particularly the last eight years, right, has been the military industrial complex uh, and its social base has been the uh, right wing of the uh, fundamentalist Christian movement. Uh, and the block that we're seeing coming in now and is still in trans, trans is still being formed and is somewhat flexible, uh, are uh, globalists who have um, understood the weaknesses of neoliberalism in terms of creating all sorts of political instability and opposition to their project throughout the world uh, and believe that they need to uh, do, uh, recreate a new social contract. Uh, uh, they're not like the New Deal uh, Keynesian. I think they have a lot more trust in the market. Uh, but uh, they certainly are different from uh, the neoliberal IMF World Bank um, uh, char uh, sort of characterizations of globalization that we were seeing in the 90s. Uh, and I was in those demonstrations uh, down in D.C. in front of the IMF, in front of the World Bank, and sweatshops and structural adjustment loans and these bastards are doing to the third world. Yeah, that was definitely a important part of the picture, but something else has been going on also. Uh, and so the crisis has shook them up. And uh, just like uh, the, the falling apart of the Soviet Union shook up the left in America and made, uh, in fact, worldwide, right? and made a lot of people rethink things. Well, their crises shake them up and they have to rethink things too. Uh, so a lot of it's in flux. Uh, and even uh, guys like Rubens and Summers, and Summers was the main guy who was responsible for purging Stiglitz out of the uh, World Bank. Uh, Summers had been writing you know, uh, columns in the Financial Times for about the last year and a half, uh, scared about uh, uh, globalization being turned back because of the inequalities and the problems and the poverty and not being addressed. And if that we want to save globalizations, we got to create a new social contract, right? Save capitalism by reforming capital. That's what FDR did. Uh, and uh, that's where these guys are starting to, to move at this point. Now, there's still big differences between having a Rubens and a Summers or a Stiglitz and a Krugman. Uh, but th that's a debate within what I would label a neo-Keynesian globalist wing of capitalism. And I'd much rather see Stiglitz and Krugman behind Barack than Rubens and Summers standing there. But it's not the same Rubens and Summers that we saw in 98. We have to understand that. There, there's, there's movement. There's new thinking. I'm not saying we get behind them, but I'm just trying to articulate what I see as happening. The other really uh, important aspect, I think, of the uh, Obama uh, election in terms of this new hegemonic bloc is the social base, and that's you and me. And uh, in using a Gramscian analysis, every hegemonic bloc has a social base, and that social base 
uh, always wins and needs uh, certain concessions from those in power uh, because those in power need to maintain legitimacy. And the way they maintain legitimacy is by meeting some of the expectations of their social base. The expectations of that Christian fundamentalist base was turn back Roe v. v versus Wade and uh, uh, defend our guns and all those issues that we've seen. Uh, so we want to literally vomit in the, in the toilet or something. You know, we're all familiar with that stuff. Uh, but um, but this, uh, this social base, I think, and if you look at the elections, there's some very important uh, parts of that social base. Uh, blacks and Latinos, extremely important part. Youth, a key part. And I would probably add uh, college-educated middle class who came out overwhelmingly in terms of their voting numbers. Now, what are the expectations of those sectors of the population? I think that's where the left and progressives like ourselves need to be. And we need to be in that movement, pushing the, the, those expectations uh, forward uh, to the fullest extent uh, and trying to uh, push Obama uh, in that direction. Now, I think Obama himself uh, has a lot of uh, progressive uh, values. Uh, he's positioned himself politically as a centrist, but nevertheless um, politically as a centrist in terms of bringing people in in his team. Uh, but when he speaks, what he speaks about, of course, is the health care and the education and uh, green technologies, and that's a pretty progressive agenda that we need to fight around and expand and push and, uh, uh, and win as many concessions as we can in there. Uh, in terms of looking at that, uh, that social base, I just will turn to your local newspaper, the New York Times has some interesting stuff on it. Um, the uh, uh, Latino voters, uh, this is in terms of how many more people went to the polls, the Latino vote increased by 24%. The black vote increased by 14%. 18 to 30-year-olds increased by 25%. Now, if we look at key states where those votes were really important, right? New Mexico, Latinos voted uh, increased numbers by 27%, uh, and youth by 71% in New Mexico. Uh, in Ohio, Blacks increased their vote by 27%. Nationally, it was 14. In Ohio, 27. North Carolina, youth plus 33%. Blacks plus 23%. Florida, blacks plus 19%. Latinos plus 27%. So if Obama wants to look at his electoral victory and who he owes uh, some concessions to, obviously blacks, Latinos, and youth are right there, and in terms of his volunteer organization, right, I mean, those are a lot of the people you're looking at and who are active and high, have high hopes and high expectations. And usually we know that most social advances come not at the depths of a depression when people have no hope, but when there's rising expectations. Those are the best times for the left to organize and push forward uh, our, the, you know, uh, radical ideas and win more people over and uh, get the best reforms we can. And within that, hopefully, renew socialist education. I love the fact that McCain attacked Obama for socialism. I just opened the door. You know, in my classes, I'm saying, redistribution of socialism, give me more. You know, and what's the, what's the reaction of the students? Yeah, that sounds good. What is this socialism? Because, you know, it's been a long time. You know, if you're 20 years old, 1989, you know, you, what, what are you, 10 years old? You know, that's all that, that old, that old red-baiting stuff, it's, it's, they don't even remember it. That's why John McCain fell so flat. He was so stuck in 1968. His head was still in that jail in, in Vietnam. He, he's still fighting that war, right? And it was just so obvious. Uh, and, uh, you know, he was the perfect candidate. That, that sort of stiff, bruised body just reminded you of how bruised neoliberalism had become, you know? It, it, it looked like he's been getting knocked around by by the loss in Iraq and uh, all the other stuff that's been happening. So um, let me uh, bring it uh, to a close here so we can take a little bit of a break. I've been going on, I think, for about 40 minutes. And uh, we can come back and have a, have a good discussion, hopefully. Yeah.
anyone's there, because the gentleman came up and asked, I do have a, a book out that this came out in soft cover, if anyone's interested. It's called The Dialectics of Globalization, and it's on uh, Cambridge Scholars Press. That's not Cambridge Press, it's Cambridge Scholars Press. And so, uh, just a, a little plug for that. So, uh, why don't we start off right here? the role of the state. Does that mean that the state is less likely to sort of serve the interests of national economic elites and somehow become mm -hmm. more oriented towards other more global constituencies? How does it affect its economic role? Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, the implication uh, for the first part of the question in terms of the global south, um, uh, two things are happening. One is the trend that I mentioned with uh, the strong emerging economies like China and Brazil and others, uh, which I think is uh, historically exciting uh, from perhaps a world systems view. You finally, perhaps the decentering of Western colonialism and imperialism that's really dominated the world, well, for about the last 500 years, really. Um, so I think that's uh, very progressive. Uh, uh, I think the, the class struggle will continue uh, and at times very fierce class struggle in all those countries uh, as uh, new elites uh, are come into being who are part of the transnational class, class and will seek to, of course, maintain their power. Uh, so it doesn't eradicate the class contradictions, but I think uh, there is this uh, changing the world system from Western-centered imperialism to more of a polycentric or multicentric um, forms of capitalism. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the state, yeah, absolutely. I think the state in, uh, is serving much more transnational interests than national capital interests. Uh, and uh, uh, because the transnational capitalist interests are the major corporations, so they've always had the major influence. So when the largest corporations were nationally based, they had tremendous uh, power within the government, and today as transnational corporations, they do too. I, I think um, the only place where they're really significantly challenged, perhaps, is the military-industrial complex. Because when you look at Raytheon and Grumman and um, uh, Lockheed Martin and General Dynamics and, uh, uh, you know, and the key players within that sector, they're much more nationally based. So when you look at assets, employment, and uh, sales, like I was talking about before for the transnationals, you don't get this at all nearly as the same level of transnationalization. Most of their assets and employment are still based in the United States or in Europe. There has been some transnationalization, but for example, Lockheed Martin, 70, 75% of their sales comes from the government. You know, so they have much more smaller transnational base and they still tend to export more than actually buying and participating in joint ventures. They do some of that, but not, not too much. So there's a clear economic base for this political split between the globalists and the military industrial complex. The, the problem that I see is that we may have a trend toward transnationalization of capital, but it may also be a contradictory trend. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the, the thing I'm thinking about in particular is the role of the state and in promoting and uh, reproducing national ideology. Now, all we have to do is remember the Republican National Convention, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, with, with, with people shouting, USA, USA, and, and this kind of stuff, to realize the role of this, this kind of ideology in class reproduction and keeping mm -hmm. people's thinking within the framework. <coughs> yeah. uh, the idea that capital can eventually develop a transnational state, no, I'm not, you're not claiming that it has in some ultimate sense, you know, but that's a... Whoa. Uh, that's a trend, you know. Uh, it comes up against a, a, uh, a contradiction. Uh, and the question for theory, from a Marxist point of view, is uh, can capitalist reproduction take place without 
divisive nationalism, without nationalism which requires an other, you know, mm -hmm. an, an, an external, uh, even if not well-defined enemy, you know, mm -hmm. to be the, uh, the, 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 the exterior threat. In the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Al Qaeda takes that role to some now, you know, the way the way the Cold War functioned earlier. But uh, if it's not England, France, and Germany as the enemies, it's the Chinese or the Japanese, or, mm -hmm. or you know, or even the Europeans. Uh, and were, uh, it could be can be seen as a contradiction of capitalism that its own internal momentum is taking it to a point where it undermines that very important tool for its mm -hmm. own control. Mm -hmm. Political uh, economic uh, disconnect in many ways. Uh, and you put your finger on something that's very important. And uh, when it comes to the transnational state, I, I, I think it's much less formed than Bill uh, thinks, thinks it is. But the, the, perhaps that's Bill a different. Robinson. Yeah, Bill Robinson thinks it is. But that's, that's perhaps another discussion. But um, the, uh, the political um, economic disconnect, I think, it is uh, confounding many of the globals. I think it's one of the problems that they're really trying to, to deal with uh, and uh, it shows this very fundamental contradiction between nationalist forms and globalist forms that I said sort of uh, constituted the main contradiction in today's era. But I don't think it's unusual. I think if we go historically uh, and look back at the uh, historic change between sort of agrarian society to uh, industrial society, that we see the same political economic uh, disconnect in many ways too. So uh, let me give the example of World War I. And we know capitalism began to develop as a world system starting in Great Britain 1750, 1760, something like that. Yet if you look at World War I, historically, the Ottoman Empire, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, the Kaiser in Germany and Prussia, the Tsar in Russia, uh, so, and all these have their roots in agrarian feudal uh, uh, political structures, right? And here we're already at that point 150 years uh, into uh, industrial capitalist development uh, worldwide, and yet you still have these old political structures that were hanging on, and it took World War I to destroy them, and then you have the Ataturk in Turkey and the Lenin in Russia, et cetera. So th that's why I call it a transitional period, and this is one of the historic, well, they may not be able to work it out. Maybe that's one of the things that will disrupt the whole transitional process is this disconnect. But I try to take a long historical view of it. 1848, Marx's Capital, you know, where he talks, you know, ca capitalism, where he talks about capitalism as a world system. It's that, that insight was incredible, but if you look at the political structure in 1848, there's a huge disconnect between the economic developments that were happening and what governments and states of that day were saying and how they the superstructure that surrounded them.